All right, we are live. Hello, everyone. My name is Brad Rosenfield, and welcome to today's BoxWorks breakout session on driving box adoption in every line of business. Now, we're going to give it just a minute or two before we really get things started here. But while we wait, I want to talk about a couple logistical items. Number one, the primary way that we'll be communicating today is via the Q&A box on your screen. So please, please, please ask questions as we move throughout today's session. We have both box and change management experts standing by to respond throughout the presentation. And also, at the end of today's session, you will be prompted to fill out a survey. We encourage you to do so. Uh, that'll give us feedback on how this session went, hopefully well, and we'll, it'll allow us to improve our sessions at future events. Now, today's session is all about driving box adoption in every line of business. My name is Brad Rosenfield. I'm a change management and education consultant here at Box. I've been on the team for a little over a year and a half now, primarily focused on helping new and existing customers to help drive end user excitement and help drive strategic adoption of Box at their organization. We've got a lot to cover in today's session, but first I wanna take a moment to talk through exactly what we'll be going over. So, on the next slide, you'll be introduced to my co-facilitator, Linda, and our incredibly talented, amazing customer panelists, Rachel and Bailey, who've joined us today to speak a little bit about their experience driving box adoption throughout their organization. After those quick intros, Linda's going to take over and talk a little bit, a little bit about what change management is and why it matters. Once we've covered the what and the why behind change management, I'm going to pop back in talk about Box's user adoption and engagement approach, aka our change management methodology. And we'll be asking Bailey and Rachel questions throughout to get their unique perspectives on how Box's approach impacted adoption within their organizations. Finally, we'll close out today's session with some final thoughts about Bailey and Rachel's experience driving adoption at their organizations. And time permitting, we'll open it up to a few questions from all of you. Now you've heard from me a little bit. I wanna pass it over to my co-facilitator, Linda Bunn. Linda. Thanks, Brad. Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here today. My name is Linda Bunn, and I'm also a change management consultant with Box Consulting. I'm based out of our headquarters here in the Bay Area, but I'm the only West Coaster here, as all of my fellow presenters today are actually out of the East Coast. Bailey and Rachel, thank you so much for being our honorary guest today. Bailey, can you start by doing a quick intro of yourself and where you're located? Sure. Hi, I'm Bailey Russell, and I'm a product owner at Walker & Dunlop, which is a commercial real estate finance company with offices all over the country, um, but I'm based in Washington, D.C. I'm so excited to be here today and wanted to say thank you to Brad and Linda for having me. Wonderful. Rachel, we'd love to hear from you as well. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Rachel Mooney. I'm an IT support technician at Emerson Collective, um, which is a social change organization. Um, while our organization is primarily based in California, I'm based in Washington, D.C. as well. Um, and thanks for inviting me to this conversation. It's great that I get to talk to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much again for being with us. And we can't wait to hear more about your journey with Box and Box Consulting. Okay. So we've mentioned change management a handful of times already. But let me explain a little bit about what it actually is and why you should even care about this topic. Um, first, I wanna just say that I think the term change management can mean many things to many people. Um, but here's a really great quote that I think sums up what we mean when we say change management. Change management is the discipline that guides how we prepare, equip, and support individuals to successfully adopt change in order to drive organizational success and outcomes. Okay, that was kind of a mouthful, but let's sort of dissect that a bit. So when we say change management at Box, it really refers to the approach that we take to help organizations overcome the challenges of moving to new ways of working. So when our Box customers like Emerson Collective and Walker and Dunlap um, are moving to a new technology, we want to help support and manage those changes that will ultimately impact employees and their day-to-day -day work. We want to help bring them along their digital transformation transformation journey through our best practices. So why should you care about this topic? Why do we think every company needs to consider change management for a project implementation or launch of a new technology? 
I think we all know that in general, change can be hard. We hear this all the time now and every day. Um, and now changes are, are multiplied due to the fact that workforces globally have been moving to remote environments and introduced to a plethora of changes, forcing us to really adapt and pivot as quickly as possible. And any introduction can, to change can typically be followed by fear or resistance to adopting a new process, system, or tool. So here's a few examples of what can happen when a change comes along. These boxes show common barriers to adoption that we've seen countless organizations face. In the top right corner here, too many tools. This is one that we see really often. Employees are often inundated with several tools that allow content to be stored in multiple places or work done in disparate solutions. This causes frustration and inefficiencies. I'm sure many of you can resonate with some of these examples. Bailey and Rachel, I'm curious, have either of you experienced any of these barriers to adoption when you are introducing Box within your organization? Um, we've experienced some resistance to change at Walker and Dunlop, which I think is understandable. Um, we've made several technology changes in 2020, in addition to working remotely. Um, I've heard, why can't we do it the old way a lot? Yeah, how about you, Rachel? Our, yeah, our situation was a little different as Box was already um, one of our core products since before I even started with Emerson. However, our team recognized that it was being underutilized and that we could focus on training and reorganization and that would really help our users. But finding time for things like training and organization uh, is difficult when everyone's so passionate about the work that they're doing. Totally, it makes sense. And I think as you take a look at this chart, be just hyper aware of what might resonate for you or your team or your company. I think you know your culture probably best. So during these times, there should be a huge focus on change management and addressing the critical people side to change. We'll talk about tangible ways to overcome these barriers in today's session. All right, so you're probably wondering, what will I actually achieve through change management? Here are some typical outcomes that we see as a result of effectively deploying a change management strategy. If you want your big launch to be successful, you want to focus on your primary audience, which are, which are your end users, the ones who are really impacted by the change. The goal is for your end users to be informed, enabled, and ready to adapt a new tool, and hopefully excited about it as well. It may sound simple, but it takes effort and strategic planning for companies to do this effectively. So I'm going to hand it over to Brad to talk about how Box approaches change management. Thanks, Linda. So now that we've got a little bit of context behind the what and the why of change management, I want to talk about Box's specific four-pillared approach on user adoption and engagement. We've got a lot of sayings here at Box. One of them is we like to say that Box is relatively easy, but change can be hard. If you don't effectively plan for change, you're not gonna get adoption and the ROI that you're looking for. So what you see here on the screen are the four pillars of Box's user adoption and engagement approach, AKA our change management methodology. And that first pillar is all about building a value proposition. How do we position Box? We wanna answer the question for your users, what's in it for me? Why should they care? Why should they change the, the way that they're working today and switch to Box. And this is also a really great opportunity to determine how Box will fit amongst the other tools available to users in your organization if you haven't done so already. And the next pillar deals with the people side of change, you know, with the intent of building what we call a change network. And to develop that change network, it's all about identifying and soliciting support and sponsorship from key stakeholders and user groups across your organization to help evangelize Box and really help to embed it into teams' workflows, processes, and day-to-day -day operations. Now, the third pillar, engaging and educating users, is relatively self-explanatory. When you're making a change at your organization, you wanna make sure that users know what is happening, when it is happening, and you wanna make sure they know how to use any new tools that are being rolled out to them, or understand how any changes to the tools that they're used to using will impact the way that they work with them. Now, some, some folks like to think that Box is so easy that you don't need training, you don't need to communicate it to your end users, they'll just naturally figure it out. Typically, that is not the case. And some of the biggest barriers to adoption that we see revolve around a lack of education and a lack of awareness and communication of the value proposition and upcoming changes. 
Finally, the fourth and final pillar, supporting measuring and tracking progress. Another quick saying we have here at Box is that go live is just the beginning. So whether you're a new Box customer or you've been around for a while, once Box is live, you should consistently be monitoring progress and getting feedback from your end users on what they think of the tool. And now that we've talked a little bit about the four pillars of driving adoption in your organization, it's important to keep in mind. Many times these four pillars happen in parallel or simultaneously rather than one after the other. You know, it's not always sequential because change in your organization is really never going to stop. We think of change as a cycle and helping to support your users with a change management strategy can really make all the difference when you're trying to get the most out of the tools that they have available to them. Now, we know some of you have already deployed Box, some of you are brand new to Box, and the change management tactics we talk about today are gonna apply to both of those groups. Now that we've covered the approach, I wanna dig a little bit deeper into each of the four pillars, starting with building a value proposition and positioning Box. And when we think about creating a value proposition, the underlying focus is communi communicating to the user what's in it for me. Now, how can we develop a message or series of messages that resonates with end users and in an ideal world actually makes them want to change? We wanna ensure that value proposition at the very least, it's the five questions that you see up on your screen. You know, we wanna develop a message that communicates to your users exactly what is changing, how things are changing, who is impacted, why we're changing, and when these changes are taking place. And by working through these questions, you can make really significant progress on developing a more compelling message to end users and helping to drive an effective change in your organization. For Box specifically, if you're thinking to yourself, all right, that sounds great, but I don't, I don't quite know where to begin, we've got some bullet points up on this slide that are a great place to start. Things as simple as uploading large files quickly and easily, marking content for access offline, access to content anytime, anywhere, on any device, and even more advanced value proposition items, like automating your workflows with Box Relay. And while you review those points up on the screen, Bailey, can you tell us a little bit about why Walker and Dunlop chose Box as the primary content management tool at the organization? Sure. So while all the features listed on the screen here are important to our users, what sets Box apart for us is Box's ability to integrate with other applications like Salesforce. Um, at WD, we use Salesforce as our CRM and pipeline management tool, and so it's crucial for us to have a corresponding folder for each of our loan and listing opportunities. That's a great point. And, uh, and Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about your experience crafting a value proposition for Box at Emerson Collective? Sorry, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, so at EC, um, EC is a very diverse organization with lots of um, different groups tackling different issues. Um, it's fast moving and widespreading. So we were already using Box and it's very easy, like you said, to just jump in. Um, so folks weren't really being taught about best practices um, when they were first joining uh, our organization. Um, so our value proposition was focused on a couple of things. Um, one would be making sure that our users um, understood what was available to them today um, and that they already had already um, and that a lot of their questions um, to us would be answered just by reacquainting them with Box's features. Um, and most importantly, we wanted to partner with um, individual teams discover their specific needs and how these features could make their day to day more fluid. Yeah, and you, you touch on a really good point there. You know, a lot of times adoption of Box can be hindered for something as simple as users don't know the full extent of what the tool can do. Uh, and also, you talk a little bit about, you know, engaging with lines of business, which brings me to our second pillar, which is focused all about building a change network. I mentioned this at the top, you know, at Box, we take a user-driven approach to change. And by that, I mean, we try to build what we call a, a change network or a cross-functional change network of supporters and influencers across the organization to help to further drive changes. And when first thinking about building a change network at your organization, you may be wondering, who at my company should be in charge of this? If you don't have a dedicated change management resource or team, uh, it can be difficult to figure that out. So I want to turn it over to Bailey and Rachel, talk a little bit about 
how they got involved with Box at their organization. Uh, Bailey? So I was actually working in the closing department at Walker and Dunlop um, and had expressed interest in the technology initiatives going on. Um, there wasn't a full-time position available in the IT group at the time, but the team needed help with the box migration. Um, I jumped at the chance and got right, um, got right involved with the content lead session with Brad for our first pilot migration and have been involved ever since. Um, I joined the IT team full-time as product owner in March. And I can definitively say, after having worked with Bailey for a little over a year now, uh, I'm very glad that you did. Uh, and Rachel, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with Box at Emerson Collective? Yeah, definitely. Um, our IT team is very collaborative around um, our practices and goals. Um, but at the same time, everyone kind of has an area that they're most focused in. Um, for me, uh, some of those areas have been managing our ticketing system and our internal help center site for IT-related questions and answers, um, and developing content and good resources um, for the entire team um, so they can know what tools are available to them and how to use them. So when the conversation on the team began, how could we be using Box more effectively, our CTO, our system admin, and myself became like the leaders of managing what this is going to look like. And we got to work very closely with uh, the Box consulting team on how to provide the educational experience and then afterwards how we were going to implement features effectively. Yeah, great examples of you know how one or even just a handful of champions at an organization can, can affect real change. And in this pillar, we're going to be talking about a specific way that you can engage with your stakeholders, it's very near and dear to my heart, uh, to help them walk end users through migrating content from one tool to another. Now, if I've learned anything at my time at Box so far, it is that content migrations can be tricky. That's an understatement in and of itself. But basically, content migrations can go wrong, and they can go wrong pretty quickly. So when you're migrating from co content from one tool to another, it can be tempting to just you know, lift and shift that content from the past to the present, wash your hands, call it a day, and move on. But once you begin to factor in a lot of the complexities, especially when you think about waterfall permissions in Box versus how permissions in, let's say, a network file share works, you'll likely realize that a change management strategy can really make all the difference between a successful and a painful content migration. And that's where the content leads approach really comes in handy. And the content lead methodology we have here at Box attempts to reframe content migrations from sort of the original way of thinking where this is an IT only task to make it more of a partnership between IT and the business. If you remember from earlier in today's session when Linda was talking about you know, the key barriers to change that we see, one of those is when business and IT objectives are not aligned. So the content leads approach is designed to combat that barrier. And it starts with identifying the content that needs to be migrated and the key stakeholders within each line of business or department who can help to design the future state of content in Box. So we'll work with these department-specific content leads to help them first understand you know, the value proposition behind why we're migrating this content and also to get their expertise in the way that their day-to-day -day business operations work. And once we do that, We'll work together to design a future state folder structure in Box that works for them, IT, and that fits with Box's permissioning settings. Once the future state folder structure is designed, the IT team creates that folder structure on the source side, let's say a network file share, and then the content leads will send out a communication to their department that we're going to be reorganizing on the source before migrating to Box. And the really important thing here is that the content leads are reorganizing content on the source side into the future state folder structure so that once everything is in the right place, you're in a position to do that simple lift and shift migration. Now, there are certainly other complexities that can arise during a content migration, which maybe don't always allow things to be, to, to be run as smoothly as I just laid them out. And that is where having someone like Bailey really comes in handy. Uh, so, like I mentioned earlier, we've been working with Bailey and the Walker Dunlop team for a while now to execute a series of content lead migrations that have resulted in huge increases in both the amount of content in their box accounts and the value that Walker and Dunlop is getting out of the tool. On top of that, almost all the work that we've done has occurred remotely 
which as you can probably imagine, added even more complexity to an already challenging process. Now, Bailey, before we go any further, can you tell us how did you identify content leads at your organization? So at WMD, each of our departments are very different. So we reached out to department heads for suggestions for content leads. Um, several groups nominated one more senior person and then one more junior person around the analyst level. Um, in my opinion, this combination worked best because the analyst level person usually had more bandwidth and time to devote to the project, while the senior level content lead had more authority to make decisions about the folder structure and migration timing. Yeah, and thank you, Billy. That is exactly why we wanted to have you join today's session. Uh, you know, ensuring that your content leads have the right blend of business and departmental knowledge, the influence to actually get things done, and the time or bandwidth to complete those required activities is critical. So I really like the way that you selected a more senior person who maybe can, can push changes through within the organization, as well as someone in maybe a less senior, more analyst type role uh, to help balance out the workload. Now, I am curious because one, one of the primary reasons that we see these kinds of engagements fail or these kinds of migrations fail is because content leads don't put in or have the required time to clean up and reorganize their content. So with that in mind, Bailey, did you do anything to incentivize these content leads? How did you navigate uh, that difficulty at Walker and Dunlop? Before we engage the content leads, we asked for approval um, from their manager and outlined the expected responsibilities and time frame for the project. We also worked with our HR department um, to put the project as a goal and objective, which is something that our performance reviews are based on. Yeah, such a great idea to incorporate HR and quarterly or yearly goals for the content leads. Basically just gives them a, uh, a value proposition, so to speak, for why they should participate. And I mentioned while going through the content leads approach, the idea of designing a future state folder structure. So what you see on your screen here is an example of a, a simplified top level folder structure we came up with for a department at Walker and Dunlop. Basically once this is designed, we can communicate this simple, easy to understand chart to the, uh, the users within the department so that they can understand how their content will be structured. And then we'll create it on the source side, reorganize the content, and then lift and shift it into box. And Bailey, this project has been and continues to be pretty successful. And we've, we've really managed to develop a strong change network for box at Walker and Dunlop. But what were, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced when you were migrating content into box? Do you have any lessons learned from the experience? I would say the biggest challenge was overseeing the locating and restructuring of content. Uh, when we started the migration to Box, we had years and years of personal, team, and loan content in several different locations. So it's been a huge effort by everyone involved to clean up the content and get it into one place um, in Box. So I had to learn to stay organized and keeping track of the progress um, and scheduling and rescheduling migrations, especially with the team migration project where we were working with multiple content leads for 16 departments. Um, I also learned that Communication is key, and when in doubt to over-communicate, I needed to make sure that users knew exactly what content was migrating at what time, um, and that they knew how to access it Monday morning after a migration weekend. Yeah, I mean, so many great points in there. I mean, I love the, the note on not necessarily knowing where all the content is when you first start out. That's something we see often. And also, on the topic of communication, that is a great segue for me to pass it to Linda to start talking through the other two pillars of our change management approach, starting with engaging and educating users in Box. Linda. Linda, you might be on mute. DVD. How about now? Good to go. Awesome. Sweet, thank you. Thanks, Brad. I loved hearing that story um, you know, from Walker and Dunlop. Having change agents like Bailey is just so critical to the, the success of these types of super complex projects. So thanks for sharing that, Bailey. All right, so shifting to our third pillar, um, engage and educate users. So as Brad mentioned earlier, it's really important to proactively communicate to your users 
make them aware of what's coming and ensure they're enabled through training and education. Even as Bailey mentioned, over communication is better than under communication. So it's really, you know, important to make sure you're connected with them. So, you know, I think we all know that traditional forms of communication used to come through things like mass email distribution or once upon a time face-to-face -face meetings. Um, it's been a really long time since I've had an, an in-person meeting. Uh, but with our shift to, you know, connecting virtually, organizations really need to find creative ways to provide frequent updates, communicate business priorities, and really build a community to stay connected. So as you look at some of these ideas here, try to leverage you know, different methods and, and be creative. So you can use things like chat groups, virtual lunch and learns, or monthly town halls. Um, you know, Emerson Collective actually has some really great examples of, of how they did this. Um, so Rachel, we'd love to hear from you. So I know that in the midst of your box project, you are also working with Fox Consulting and you just launched Zoom um, around the same time that you are all shifting to a remote workforce. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the different ways that you connected with your Box users um, and your employees during this time? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so for some context, we started working with Fox Consulting around mid-February and then completely unrelatedly had planned to move over to Zoom in mid-March. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, we were in a global moment of upheaval um, and everyone everywhere was trying to figure out their footing in this new reality um, while working from home and finding yourself asking questions like, how are we going to stay collaborated? How are we going to stay organized? How are we going to stay together as a team? Um, and even though these are all things that you're, you were thinking about before, in the midst of the pandemic, it became a more emotional need uh, to feel connected um, to get the work that you needed to do done and just feel like you were doing something productive. Um, and we could have canceled our trainings. Um, we'd already planned um, these around do it being in site and in person. Um, but Box was a solution to those questions of collaborating and staying connected. Um, so we and the, the Box team moved very quickly into making everything um, into a virtual plan. We were going to do everything via Zoom. Um, and that was simultaneously while we were launching Zoom. So I think it really helped demonstrate that working from home was possible and fully remote meetings were possible and that we could stay connected um, in that way. And when speaking to individual uh, users, we were getting that same feedback. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea of really meeting people where they are. I mean, everyone was kind of going um, through different different moments in, in during that time. So really being empathetic with your team members um, is much appreciated. So I know as an existing Box customer, you also work with our team to gather some insightful data from your current Box users by capturing feedback and challenges that they had with using Box um, to, you know, identify uh, areas of improvement. So I know you did a ton of analysis reviewing several help desk tickets. You sent out a huge end user survey. Um, and you even performed interviews um, with four different lines of businesses. Um, so, you know, I know here we've captured some example pain points from the interactions that you had with your stakeholders. Um, but Rachel, just curious, you know, what was your reaction during, um, you know, reading some of that feedback and any key themes that you were hearing? Uh, yeah, um, hearing the feedback was very helpful all around. Um, you might feel that you have an understanding of what people are experiencing, what your coworkers are experiencing, but to really have empathy and understanding, you need to hear the words directly from them. Um, and like you said, we did this in a few ways. Um, we went through reviewing our IT ticket history, um, and in that we could see snapshots of issues um, or questions that employees were having like the moment that they happened, because you submit a ticket in the moment. Um, so we could look through there and see what was going on. And then um, the box team um, developed a survey for our staff um, and the responses from that gave us a lot of insight into what people felt looking back at their experiences. So we got kind of those two perspectives. And then doing the in-person interviews with stakeholders with different teams um, helped us explore like what their day-to-day -day workflow looked like and how Box was 
being used currently, and then together brainstorming solutions around those things. Um, so overall, um, though sometimes you're afraid to get feedback, feedback is, um, was, is definitely helpful in moving forward. For sure. I, I'm sure it was really great just to listen to their needs and really hear them out, their pain points, challenges, and even you know, key wins. So um, you were able to really take action as a result of that. Um, and so I know that on top of all of that work, um, you had a pretty robust training strategy as a result of, of collecting a lot of that data. Um, you did a total of six live virtual trainings via Zoom, uh, led by one of our box educational spe specialists, um, and even created a five-minute custom video related to box for your end user. So talk a little bit more about how you use that data to inform the training content, um, and you know what did the users think of think of the trainings overall? Um, I think like we from all of our research, um, we knew a lot of users um, hadn't received a true like lay of the land guide to box. Um, so it was important to us to have those like 101 sessions just to make sure everyone was working with the same toolkit. Um, and then for the beyond the basics training, we knew our users were saying, okay, I've got the basics. Now how can we collaborate more fluidly, um, especially now that we are working remotely? Like what are the, what's the next level of what I could be doing? Um, and then for our custom video, um, when trying to think of how we, um, how we could utilize that because um, we had five minutes to do whatever we wanted. Um, we went through our, through going through the tickets and the surveys, we knew our uh, two biggest questions were around uh, like sharing links and permissions and live collaboration. So we said, let's go all in on that on the in the five minute video and just this will be a handy resource if like for people who just, I just need to understand these things that we had questions about and just bring them up to speed and then that helps resolve them. It just kind of removed a pain point right away. Yeah, really impressive. I mean, you you leverage the different training options based off of the audience and their level of expertise with Box and offered some more advanced training for the existing user. So it's very, very impressive overall. Okay, so uh, I want to shift to our fourth and final pillar, which is support, measure, and track progress. You know, remember that go live is just the beginning, um, and you want to continue engaging with users and, and keep the momentum going and monitor feedback along the way. So I want to talk about results and how we measure success through these change programs. I swear this is our last quoted slide, um, but I'm a strong believer um, that most projects and initiatives often fail or are unsuccessful when there's a lack of organizational change management. I mean, this could be a huge hit to your ROI if you don't consider some of these needs. Um, so I think, you know, through working with our Box customers in, in the past, we consistently see a big increase in user adoption and user activity as a result of our change management approach. So I want to talk a little bit about um, business outcomes for, for you, Rachel, at Emerson Collective. I know that you did so much activity, you put in a lot of effort uh, with your team and with the Box Consulting team, um, and you found some really effective ways while gathering that feedback and data to really take action on them. Um, so can you talk about some of the key wins and success metrics um, that were achieved as a result of all of this work? Yeah, we, um, so all of the trainings we did, um, we, took the, we recorded them, so they were gonna be available. Um, going forward, we could now use them uh, to answer specific questions or for onboarding new users. Um, so we didn't have to like hold the fish, like another training, we now had those resources. Um, and then we also created um, article content that corresponded with the topics in the uh, training. So that way it was easy to refer back to them if people were like, wait, I wanna make sure I got that, it was there. Um, but really like in terms of outcomes, um, it's really the change in conversation surrounding Box that has really struck me. Um, we've gone back and looked through the last four or five months since our training um, and interviews and all that happened. And the questions we've received in tickets have completely evolved. Um, instead of getting questions about sharing links and collaboration settings, folks are reaching out about what the next step is around creating a more efficient organizational structure and discussing specific, specifics about using Box as their team and how they could be using it 
Um, and it's still an ongoing thing. Um, we are in different stages of conversation with different areas about um, what that looks like for them. Um, and it's really exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. I, the evolution of the conversations and the type of tickets shows that you know users are really advancing how they're using Box and their expertise has clearly been up leveled. And I know that um, you told me how impressed you were in the Box Notes usage after all of this. Can you just give a little anecdote about um, what you were telling me before? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Box Notes has become like my personal favorite thing about Box. I every meeting I have, I just open a new blank one just so I like have it um, in case I need to take notes or I want, we need to suddenly start an outline and it's so easy to share. Um, but what was interesting is um, like after the trainings, um, hearing about, um, I was going to have a meeting with someone and they mentioned that their manager said we should make, like have a box note about what we talked about. And this, the person uh, in question like just never had embraced using box at all and was had outright suggested using a box note. And I was like, that's it. We won. <laughs> We had success if we got yeah. people using Box Notes. I love that. We use that at Box quite a bit, so it is also one of my favorite features um, amongst Box. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Rachel, for sharing your story and, and some of the key wins. I'm going to hand it over to Brad to hear about Walker and Dunlop once more before we close out our session. Thanks, Linda. We are absolutely cruising through the session today, so we're definitely going to have some time at the end for Q&A, uh, so stick around for that and we'll be able to, uh, to answer some of your questions. But I did mention earlier in today's session that we've had a lot of success at Walker and Dunlop so far, and I wanna put some metrics behind that comment now. So out of a little more than 1,000 users, so 1,084 users, uh, Walker and Dunlop is seeing pretty incredible 28-day active adoption rates of 99%. And just for context, those 28-day active rates are anyone taking a thoughtful action in Box? So basically doing anything beyond just logging in. And Bailey, now that the majority of Walker and Dunlop users are on Box, how are you planning to continue engaging and gathering feedback from them? So I've been hosting department-specific Box refreshers, which I think has been the best way to engage our users so far. Um, similar to what Rachel was talking about with user interviews, um, I can get a lot of feedback that way, and we can go through day-to-day -day examples of using Box um, for their business process. Um, I'm also sending out feature announcements, um, like for the new Box UI and collections, um, and we're working on publishing internal blog posts with tips and tricks. Um, and lastly, I'm planning to record some WD-specific demos that we're going to use for new hire training. Those are, those are all such, such fantastic ideas. I can't wait to see how they all play out at Walker and Dunlop. And before, before I go through some of the closeout items in today's session, I want to open it back up to both you, Bailey, and Rachel. Uh, any final comments that you'd like to share today about your overall Box experience or your experience working with Box Consulting? Yes, yeah, so I just want to say that while the timing of our migration um, was sometimes challenging with remote work, it's really been awesome that our users have been able to access their content from home without needing to be logged into the WD network, um, which wasn't always the case for us before. Um, and it's been a pleasure working with you, Brad, and everyone at Box Consulting over the past year. Um, like I said, it's been a huge effort um, to get all of our content into Box, and we couldn't have done it without you all. Well, it has been a pleasure on our side as well. And Rachel, any final comments from you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the experience working with the team at Box, um, shout out to uh, Aaron and Rebecca, who were fabulous. Um, it was really great working with a team who had been through this before and had like real world experience with what they'd seen at other organizations and then be able to listen to us and hear um, what we were experiencing and for us to be able to collaborate in the middle. Um, I would definitely do it again in a heartbeat. Um, uh, we mentioned before about um, box notes being now like a popular uh, feature um, amongst our users. Um, but another thing that um, has been interesting is um, we do like when we do get those tickets that are asking about sharing permissions and collaboration. Normally, someone from 
that person's team who happened to be CC'd on the ticket says, oh, no, I can fix that. We just need to add them as this. Or, oh, no, I changed that link. I get, and we don't, we as the IT team don't have to take any action because people are feeling uh, empowered from the whole experience. Yeah, it sounds like you almost have uh, some box champions of your own acting as a, uh, a first line of defense for any, <laughs> any box issues or questions that come up. Now, I wanna give a big thank you to everyone who's on the line for attending today's session and a huge shout out to both to my co-facilitator, Linda, and our customer panelists, Bailey and Rachel. I really appreciate y'all joining. And before we switch things over to Q&A, I, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't at least do a very quick plug for the organization that I'm a part of, which is Box Consulting. Now, we discussed a lot of great strategies today for driving box adoption within your organization, but if you're looking for some extra help, Box Consulting has you covered. Our final saying of the session today is Box is better with consulting. So if you're interested in learning more about what we have to offer, you can go, go ahead and reach out to your account executive or customer success manager for more info. Again, huge thank you to everyone who attended and to Linda, Bailey, and Rachel for joining me. And we're gonna open it up to Q&A. Let's see, let's see what we have in there. Um, ooh, question, let's see here. Would you agree finance is the toughest department to move to box? What have you used to resolve Excel link issues? Uh, so finance is because of link spreadsheets, we do find that finance departments are typically pretty difficult to migrate and sort of keeping with the theme of this whole session, uh, the most important thing that we've done or that we recommend is getting in touch with the, the key stakeholders within the finance organization, getting in touch with them early and understanding the prevalence of link spreadsheets within the organization and also any automated processes that they may be working with in their day to day today that we then need to translate to Box. Uh, I know here at Box Consulting, we can run some reports on your content to get a feel for, you know, how prevalent are our link spreadsheets or linked files and also are they absolute or relative links? Uh, so there's, there's a few things that you can do there to help make it a little bit more seamless. Let's see. I, I like this one question um, to Bailey and Rachel. Is there anything you would do differently if you could go back and do it again? Um, I don't know if there's anything I would necessarily do differently. I mentioned um, how it's really important to be organized throughout the migration and I would just say, you know, just reaching out to the content leads early, trying to find all that content and know exactly where it is um, before we got too deep into the migration project. Um, that's really all I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I'd probably add it's definitely looking at hindsight. There's things that I wish that we uh, did um, just because of the timing of everything. Um, the a push to let's start reevaluating organizational structure um, was not the most important thing to talk about in April. Um, so it kind of slowed down the momentum. But now that we're all um, more comfortable in working from home and working remotely, um, that definitely has picked up in the last two months. Definitely. I'm, uh, I'm seeing another question here that you know was answered by one of our specialists today but i think is applicable to the whole group you know for those of you that have been using box for a while now and are looking to do a cleanup of old content can you share with us some advice or best practices and beyond just working with content leads as a sort of a starting place or a great way to to spearhead that content cleanup uh, some of our other best practices involve you know think about how are these users interacting with the content you can see when was it last accessed when was it last modified and think about, okay, if this, if this piece of content or this group of content hasn't been accessed in the last, I don't know, few years, is that, is that content that could be theoretically archived to help clean things up? But at the end of the day, it's really important that at the very least you engage with the user to understand how they're working with that content and which content is still relevant to them. I want to answer one of these questions that might be helpful to the audience. Are there any user training material repositories that we could upload to our centralized training platform? Um, we do have a lot of materials on our support.box.com website. 
everything from communication templates to user training videos. We also have through Box University um, self-paced courses and live courses that you can register for for free. Um, so you can absolutely point your users to any of these support links or grab them and upload them into your centralized training platform. Um, and actually, I know Rachel, you have worked on um, a really great internet and self-service sort of portal for your users to access materials. Do you want to give any tips and tricks with that? Yeah, I think it's important um, when looking at your an internal audience is to know um, what tools they have available to them and then framing your training around that. Um, if you're using any particular like sign-on system, if you're using any particular email system, being able to like focus um, your internal content um, to match that makes it easier to adopt. Um, but a lot of the materials um, we got um, directly from Box are created um, with our consulting team around like tools and what their uses are um, have gone directly up on our site. Yeah, and I know, you know, depending on the audience as well, how they like to be trained and, and get educated matters as well. So some may prefer videos, some may prefer give me a user guide, some may want some more handheld, you know, live training. So I would also consider, you know, what your different um, stakeholder groups are and, and how they like to be trained upon and kind of segment from there as well. All right, we've got, a, we've got a big one up top. Our org has experienced issues with the fact that files owned by a user who gets deactivated become unshared. Now there's workarounds where, you know, if they're owned by a service account and not a human user, but that can be difficult to get on top of. I'm assuming you have an open folder structure in your box account uh, and collections are helpful, but the use, this, uh, this attendee is wondering, are there any, you know, pushes to move away from waterfall permissions? Not that I am aware of, um, and then is there anything we can do so that when someone either leaves the company or deactivates their account, that content doesn't become unshared? Um, typically in this instance, that's where we would recommend a closed folder structure. And the Box Consulting team has a lot of great resources in helping you to navigate the switch from open to closed. But at the very least, at the end of the day, it's, it does come back to the four pillars that we talked about today. You know, talking about the building that value proposition for why we're moving from an open to a closed folder structure, identifying the people within your organization who can help to affect that change. Very important would be communicating users about what is changing and when it is changing and educating them exactly how their box experience is going to differ. And personally, I love collections and I think that they've made such a significant difference in the switch from an open to a closed folder structure because you're no longer taking away that flexibility, you're just replacing it with a slightly different functionality. Uh, and then once you've made the switch, arguably the most important thing you can do is to stay in touch with your users and make sure that they feel supported throughout the life of the change. We have another great question, I think to both Rachel and Bailey. Um, any plans to do more with Box going forward? Um, so, Rachel, I know that um, there are some additional project work that you have been involved in with some box add-on features and security features. Anything you want to highlight and share? Um, yeah, we're still in the process of rolling out um, all the governance features. Um, we've been working um, on rolling out shields um, to kind of help with the um, how the sharing and permissions work um, within our files. Um, but um, like I said, we're still working with teams on maximizing things for their needs specifically. Um, I'm currently scheduling two meetings next week to talk to two of our teams because um, they reached out. Um, so very excited about what's coming up in the future for us. Amazing. Bailey, how about you? Um, I mentioned that we um, integrate Salesforce with Box um, at WMD. So one thing that we've been working on um, for a while now and are really excited about is um, having external sharing um, in Box, and those, that's going to be for our loan folders. Um, and we're, we have that all integrated with Salesforce, and Salesforce will initiate the collaborations to the contacts. Um, 
So it's been a big effort and we're really excited to get that rolled out soon. Awesome. All right, and I see another question in here. How did you effectively migrate users from OneNote to Box? That is more of a tricky migration. Uh, to, to my knowledge, I don't believe you can migrate the full OneNote. Uh, you would migrate the individual OneNote files to Box. Uh, so you wouldn't be able to have them all connected, but you could in, uh, migrate the individual files. And again, sort of tying everything back to what we've been talking about in today's session, uh, just focusing on making sure that you communicate clearly to all of your users exactly how their experience is going to change. And now we have another one at the top around which pillar in your user adoption methodology has been the most difficult phase where you've seen the most customers struggle with it? And how have you resolved that? I can take a crack at this first and then I can pass it to you, Linda. Uh, for me, I think the most difficult, it tends to, it tends to go between, you know, build, actually all of them can be difficult depending on, you know, the unique situation. But building a change network has a, has a chance of being the most difficult, especially when, you know, if some customers aren't interested in engaging with their end users or if they've never done it before and they aren't comfortable. And then other customers find difficulty with the support measure and track progress because, you know, their, their metrics are graded against is Box Live. Not necessarily are folks using it. Not necessarily are they having a good experience. So really, you know, trying to promote the idea that this is not a one-time change, you know, once Box or any tool that you're rolling out is live in, and in the hands of your users, and that you wanna to continue to, to engage with them and understand their experience, helping to build a value prop for the methodology itself can actually be helpful. Linda, how about you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, so I was actually gonna say, I think build a value proposition has been um, sometimes the challenge with the customers that I've worked with, uh, because I think when you are launching a big project or program at your company, you're often thinking about the bottom line and how it's going to benefit um, you, whether you're part of the IT team or exec team. Um, and so when you're building out the why should I care and what's in it for me, you're forgetting that it's actually in the eyes of an end user and not necessarily for the business itself. Um, so it's really important when you think about the key benefits of rolling out a tool like Box or other tools, you're thinking about how is this actually gonna make the lives of the employees much easier in their day-to-day -day work and not necessarily, is this gonna bring me a ton of money for my organization by saving X amounts of dollars? So I think pivoting some of that perspective to what is this going to do for your end users? And again, what's in it for them? Um, I've found that to be a really you know, great eye opener for, for our customers. And Linda, just building off that briefly, uh, you, you may notice that neither myself or Linda mentioned communicating and educating as the most difficult pillar because it's, it's simple in theory, but in practice, it's extremely easy to overlook it which can have really detrimental effects on how adoption goes with your rollout. Brad, this is a good question if you want to, if you want to take this one. Are there built-in tools within Box to engage our staff? Built-in tools. I believe, if memory serves correctly, there's, we've been adding some little pop-ups here and there for uh, like, hey, have you tried out annotations? Have you tried out Box Notes? Have you tried out Box Mobile? So there's some things in the mix with Box today, and I believe there are more coming in the future. Yeah, and I would say you can definitely leverage some of the native features as well, like comments and tasks to get, uh, it may reduce some emails or you know chat messages to your team. Um, and you can, you know, as you're collaborating together, you can definitely engage them that way. Or if you use integrations, like, uh, you know, we have Slack and Zoom integrations, it's an easy way to, um, you know, be in Box and easily send a link through Slack um, directly from Box through that integration. So there's a ton of integrations out there, um, depending on what tool stack you use, that you can really leverage to get some engagement. Now, it looks like we have time for about one or two more. I see one at the top. You know, we've struggled to get boosters. We're, we're struggling to, you know,
find box champions within our organization. Can you offer best practices for building a champions list? Um, so, I mean, one of the best places to start would probably be, you know, try and look at your, your box usage reports and try and understand who are my power users? Who are the folks that are using box in the most sophisticated ways within my organization and reach out to them to understand, you know, what's their take on box? What are they struggling with? What do they like about it? Because they can be really powerful champions for change within your organization. And, you know, it's not just me as a consultant who probably has best practices. I do want to open it up to Bailey and Rachel in case you found anything at your organization that was helpful for, for finding your box champions. Um, I think what I said um, earlier in the presentation about reaching out to department heads or if, if you have any kind of other stakeholders who might be able to help you, um, or maybe you've had stakeholders in the past for other IT initiatives, um, we looked at that too when we were looking for box content leads. Um, and I think just explaining the project and, and the benefits, the value proposition um, to those department heads too to make sure they're interested and understand how important it is that they nominate someone from their department um, and help out with the project and that, you know, it's really important for them in order for their department to have success in the future, um, you know, once you've migrated to Box or as you go forward with Box. Yeah, and I'd also add, um, now this might be hypocrisy to say, but going in and just trying to learn from your users about what they're doing in general, not necessarily with the, um, goal to see how box can fit into their lives and their the migration pattern but just understand what they're um, working on what their day-to-day -day looks like what um, problems they run into their pain points um, help you figure out who would be the most um, passionate about making these changes and also um, knowing more about how to build a more personal value proposition for them um, because you now know what they're thinking and going through um, and can see how the things you were already planning to do will help the situation. All excellent points. I think we are, we're running up on time right now. So for those of you still with us, another big thank you to all of you for attending and a huge thank you again to Linda Bailey and Rachel for joining today's session. Uh, I encourage you to uh, check out some of the other Box breakout sessions like getting the most out of Box or getting the most out of Box uh, Admin Heroes networking chat or making the most of best-in-class security features. Um, thank you so much for joining and have a great rest of your day and enjoy the rest of BoxWorks. Thank you. Thank you all so much.